Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is on the book of Hebrews. It's entitled, and interestingly enough, In These Last Days, The Message of Hebrews. In These Last Days? Hmm. This is lesson number eight in that series for February 19 of 2022, entitled, Jesus, the Mediator of the New Covenant. Hmm, wonder what that means. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we've come once again to understand your will, to think about you as clearly as we possibly can, and to review these words that you inspired your famous apostle to write. May we understand more about the New Covenant, more about you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. In order to fully understand the purpose of the life and death of Jesus Christ, we need to have a clear understanding of the great controversy over the character and government of God. I do not believe it's possible to understand all that Jesus tried to accomplish the reason for his coming and so forth, and we're gonna see some of the quotations that support that idea. So I really believe it's necessary for us to have that understanding. That great controversy, one, began in heaven. Remember that, that's an important part of the whole story. Two, involves the entire universe. Again, another very important part of the whole story. And three, is the basis on which we have come to understand God. God stated in Genesis 2, 16 and 17, those words, and I can read them right now. He said to him, you may, it said, this is God speaking to Adam, you may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden except the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad. You must not eat the fruit of that tree. If you do, you will die the same day. That could also be translated, you will certainly die. It's another way of translating that. That sin would lead to death. Satan categorically denied that that was true, claimed that, claiming that God had lied to Adam and Eve. Genesis 3, 1 to 5, and I'm sure you're familiar with that story where the serpent spoke to Eve. How are we supposed to learn about the death that God talked about in the Garden of Eden? It is through Jesus. By his life and his death, Jesus answered the most important questions about God's character and government. One, what kind of a person is God? And two, what is it that causes the death of sinners? Jim? Hebrews 10, 5 to 10. For this reason, when Christ was about to come into the world, he said to God, you do not want sacrifices and offerings, but you have prepared a body for me. You are not pleased with animals burnt whole on the altar or with sacrifices to take away sins. Then I said, here am I to do your will, O God, just as it is written of me in the book of the law. First he said, you neither want nor are, nor are you pleased with sacrifices and offerings or, the, or with animals burnt on the altar and sacrifices to take away sins. He said this even though all this all these sacrifices are offered according to the law. Let me interrupt there for just a second. Now, it, it, it might, we might be tempted to think, well, the reason the Old Testament things didn't work is because they, they didn't follow the directions. No, Paul says they followed the directions, but the system didn't work, okay? But God gave that system. Yes, he did. So how can it not work? because it, 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 was a, it was a sandbox illustration. We're gonna to go to this in quite a more de bit more detail later, but it was a sandbox illustration about the basics. It wasn't even close to a full explanation of everything God wanted to teach us, but it was a start. And they brought, the children of Israel left the land of Egypt after s several hundred years of, of uh, pagan education. Yeah. And, and of course, <laughs> They, they think that the, the deity needs is in need of something. Or well, if you have, if I really have the true God, the true God is in need of nothing. Mm -hmm. Then he said, here am I, O God, to do your will. God doesn't, 
God, excuse me, so God does away with all the old sacrifices and put the sacrifice of price in their place because Jesus did what God wanted him to do. We are purified from sin by the offering that he made of his own body once and for all. American Bible Society, 1992, Good News Translation. Wow. So this would suggest that while there are things we can learn from that Old Testament system, the new system completely replaces that old system. Okay, so that's important for us to think as we work our way through this lesson. While they were traveling through the desert, the children of Israel were given the entire sacrificial system. We know about that at the foot of Mount Sinai, based in the sanctuary, which was placed in the midst of the camp. You remember that? That system was a kind of sandbox illustration of the plan of salvation. It certainly was not a complete or detailed explanation of everything that God needed to say to us. Carrie? Reading Hebrews chapter 7, verses 11 through 19. It was on the basis of the Levitical priesthood that the law was given to the people of Israel. Now, if the work of the Levitical priests had been perfect, there would have been no need for a different kind of priest to appear one who is in the priestly order of Melchizedek, not of Aaron. For when the priesthood is changed, there also has to be a change in the law. Now you remember that back when, when Aaron was assigned to be the high priest, it was said, okay, only his descendants can do this. So then if you're going to say, okay, now someone else is going to come and do it, then you have to have a change in the law, right? Okay. And our Lord, of whom these things are said, belonged to a different tribe, and no member of his tribe ever served as a priest. It is well known that he was, a, he was born a member of the tribe of Judah, and Moses did not mention this tribe when he spoke of priests. Okay, now what were the, what were the tribe of Judah supposed to be? Kings. They were the kings. Okay. The matter becomes even plainer. A different priest has appeared who is like Melchizedek. He was made a priest, not by human rules and regulations, but through the power of a life which has no end. For the scripture says, you will be a priest forever in the priestly order of Melchizedek. The old rule then is set aside because it was weak and useless. For the law of Moses could not make anything perfect and now a better hope has been proved, provided rather, through which we come near to God. Good news Bible is where we're dealing with. Okay, now I want you to think about this for a moment. Who do we believe wrote these words? Paul. Paul. What was Paul's upbringing? He was, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He believed in the letter of the law absolute detail you follow everything exactly and you will have a guaranteed position in the in the courts of heaven right that's what he believed that's what he grew up with think of what he's right now amazing transformation what's responsible for that transformation that story in the trail in the road to damascus huh that that gave him a different view of things so that he put all the old testament in different light and said aha I've got it. Yeah, well, it's what we call like a, fruit a, basket, a fruit basket upset. On the, what you were referring to a few minutes ago, that you need a change in the law so that the, yeah. for the priesthood. And here it says, clear back in Ezekiel, excuse me, Exodus 19.6, yeah. you become a kingdom of priests. Yeah. Everybody. We're going we're gonna to talk about that in a moment. Thank you for bringing that up. After having given the answers to the most important questions and accusations of Satan in the great controversy, Jesus became our mediator in the courts of heaven. And we're going to, that's obviously what this lesson is about. The ancient Levitical priesthood based on genealogy, in other words, you've got to be a descendant of Aaron, was never able to answer the most important questions in the great controversy, and it did not c cause sinning to stop. Notice these words of Paul. Gordon? Hebrews 9, 13 and 14 from the Good News Bible. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a burnt calf are sprinkled on the people who are richly unclean, and this purifies them by taking away their ritual impurity. 
Now notice he says their ritual impurity. In other words, they had gone to the rites. They had gone to the, the ceremonies that were supposed to do that. Okay? Verse 14, since this is true, how much more is accomplished by the blood of Christ? Through the eternal, th through the eternal spirit, he offered himself as a perfect sacrifice to God. His blood will purify our consciences from useless rituals so that we may serve the living God. So Paul says, those, usual, those rituals that I used to think were the whole method for being saved in heaven, those are useless things. They're not of any value anymore because Jesus has come, he has lived and he's died, and this is the new way, this is the new covenant, this is the new agreement that God has set for us to, to follow. So let's, let's dive into that. In what way does the blood of Jesus purify our consciences from useless rituals? Is it that since the true sacrifice has been offered and we have a chance to understand the meaning of the death of Christ, useless rituals have no more meaning? Is that what's happening here? Is it saying that, okay, now that we have understood why Jesus had to die, the old way of sacrificing animals and so forth is no longer necessary? Seems like that's what he's saying, right? In the old system, the children of Israel were only allowed to approach God at the outer gate of the tabernacle court. The outer gate, right there. Only the priests were able to go further inside and into the holy place. Only the high priest could enter into the most holy place, and only once a year. But on his last night on this earth with his disciples before the crucifixion, Jesus explained to them that a mediator was no longer really needed. You don't have to stand outside of the gate. You can do what? John 16, 25 to 27. Jesus said, I have used figures of speech to tell you these things, but the time has come when I will not use figures of speech. I will speak to you plainly about the Father. When that day comes, and it was then. You will ask him in my name. And I, I want to say this correctly, so I'm taking my time here. Okay. And I do not say, notice the word not, which many leave out as they read this passage, since it, it is a, the word not does not match their paradigm. Some of us have seen pastors read over that passage more than once and the, the word not just disappears out of their sight. They just, it, it can't be there. And when it's brought to their attention, they say that's heresy? Yes, some do. Well, well, I remember the quotation was, if, if Jesus is not praying for us, all is lost. Yes. What's, something to that effect. Yeah. I have dyslexia and I, it, my words don't get backwards, but I can very easily read yeah. And and skip a, a two or a not, and it makes a big difference in a final. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> are, are, are you just the opposite? Are you giving those pastors a, a an excuse? No, I'm just saying read every word. <laughs> Carefully. <laughs> Carefully. That the Bible says. Yes, that the Bible says. Uh, finishing up, it says. Um, that I, I will say that again. I do not say. I do not say that I will ask him on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you. He loves you because you love me and have believed that I came from God. Wow. So, as the greatest texts yeah. in the Bible. Yeah. I like when the, the next text it says, well, now you're talking plainly, yeah. not in any riddles or yeah. parables or something. This is why it was possible for Paul to say in Hebrews 10, 19 to, to 23, and I'm reading, we have then, my brothers and sisters, complete freedom to go into the most holy place by means of the death of Jesus. I mean, here's Paul who believed in absolute, you, you, nobody violates that. You, only if you in a certain status you can go here and only if your other certain status can you go there and only the high priest can go into that most holy place and now what's he saying he believes what we just read in, in john uh, 16. we have then my brothers and sisters complete freedom to go into the most holy place by means of the death of jesus 
Now, whatever the death of Jesus did, and we still need to get to that in more detail, but it made, it opened the most holy place, the very presence of God, it's open to all of us. He opened for us a new way and a living way through the curtain, that is, through his own body. We have a great priest in charge of the house of God. Let us come near to God with a sincere heart and a sure faith, with hearts that have been purified from a guilty conscience and with bodies washed with clean water. And those are, those are part of the ancient rituals. Let us hold on firmly to the hope we profess because we can trust God to keep his promise. He gave the oath, remember? God gave his oath. Hopefully, yeah. yeah. John wrote his gospel quite late mm -hmm. after Hebrews was written. Yes. But were these words of Jesus, do you think that the words of Jesus oh. were well known to the disciples and to Paul? How, how could John... The, these words from John 16, yeah. 25 to 27? How could John have, I mean, written about it so much later if he had, didn't know them somehow? I mean, how could, how could people ignore those words? How come it's in none of the other Gospels? You weren't supposed to ask that. I did. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a question I have really struggled with. And, and you not know, just in the other Gospels, but again, since John was one of the last books of the Bible written, mm -hmm. why isn't it in any of the others? Why didn't Paul say that yeah. explicitly? Well, he said exactly. pretty much, the, the passage I just read to you, pretty much says that same thing. Well, a little more, a little deeper, a little more complicated language. A lot more complicated language. Okay. Hopefully, now that we have learned the truth about God and the truth about the consequences of sin, there's no need to be afraid of God. What we need to fear is sin. The Old Testament system served day after day to remind people of their sins, and that sin leads to death, even of innocent victims. It was supposed to point forward to the sacrifice of Christ. Is there any evidence in the books of Moses suggesting that the people understood that the sacrificial system pointed forward to the death of Christ? Read about that in the book of Le Leviticus, do you? Numbers, Exodus, Deuteronomy? One of the few passages in the Old Testament talking about the death of Christ and its consequences is Isaiah 53. Notice especially verses 4 through 11. Myra, I think that's, that's mine. I'm sorry. Ephesians, uh, Isaiah, I'm sorry, Isaiah 53. Now we're, we're going way down from the days of Moses to the prophet Isaiah. But he wrote these very important words. But he endured this talking about this suffering servant. That's what he calls him. He didn't call him by name. He calls him the suffering servant. But he endured the suffering that should have been ours. The pain that we should have borne. So that if we're sinful. We deserve this. All the while we thought that his suffering was punishment sent by God. Now, why does he say it like that? What does he mean? We thought it, but it wasn't true. Okay, that's the implication, isn't it? We thought it was punishment sent by God, but it wasn't. But because of our sins, he was wounded, beaten because of the evil we did. Now, it doesn't say God did it. We are healed by the punishment he suffered. Is it really because of sin? Uh -huh. Rather, is, is our sins is really in there? Uh -huh. Because of our sins, he was wounded. I know, but because of our, sin, yeah. I think but be, yeah. uh, because of sin would be better. Yeah. We are healed by the punishment he suffered, made whole by the blows he received. All of us were like sheep that were lost, each of us going his own way. So in other words, if we clearly understood why Jesus had to die and what was accomplished by that, we should have a path open into the most holy place, right? But the Lord, and this is Yahweh, made the punishment fall on him, the punishment all of us deserved. Now that doesn't mean, even that doesn't mean, the, it doesn't say the Lord punished him. It says the Lord made the punishment fall on him. In other words, we would say, and I absolutely believe, that God says, okay, let the punishment that sin causes fall on Jesus. Okay? And he was treated, happened. what? And that's what happened. Yeah. 
He was treated harshly, but endured it humbly. He never said a word like a lamb about to be slaughtered, like a sheep about to be sheared. He never said a word. He was arrested and sentenced and led off to die, and no one cared about his fate. He was put to death for the sins of our people. He was placed in a grave with the wicked. He was buried with the rich. I mean, this is written 700 years, more or less, before it actually happened. And of course, that would mean to some of our critics that it couldn't have been written back then. Because not, uh, they say that not even God can predict, predict the, future. the future. That's right. The Lord says, Yahweh says, it was my will that he should suffer. His death was a sacrifice to bring forgiveness. And we who read the book of Revelation or read the latter part of the New Testament say, this plan was put in place before the foundation of the world. God knew this was coming before he created Adam and Eve. Okay? His death was a sacrifice to bring forgiveness, and so he will see his descendants, he will live a long life, and through him many of my purpose will succeed. After a life of suffering, he will again have joy. Do you think Jesus was joyful when he entered the gates of heaven after his experience with crucifixion and so forth? He will know that he did not suffer in vain. My devoted serpent with whom I am pleased will bear the punishment of many, and for his sake I will forgive them. So what we have, what we have suggested here is that God allowed Jesus to suffer the consequences of sin because it needed to be demonstrated. And the demonstration look, is for teaching, education. Yeah. Does it look like Isaiah 53, 4, where we thought that it was punishment was sent for God, is in contradiction to Isaiah 53, 6 through 11? Well, unless you read it very carefully and read between the lines, it could look like it's in contradiction. Unfortunately, the interpretation that has been put on the life and death of Christ by so many suggests that the punishment that should have been ours was placed on Christ, by God, of course. This seems to be the teaching of verses 6 and 7. However, that seems to be in contradiction to verse 4, all the while we thought that his suffering was punishment sent by God. So way back in Isaiah's day, God says, be careful. When you read this passage, when you understand what's going on, be careful. Don't misunderstand. So which is it? Did the people in the Old Testament recognize the truth of God's statement given in the Garden of Eden that sin is what kills and not God who kills? Well, how do you understood, understand Romans 3, 1 through 4? As I read, Romans 3, 1 to 4, have the Jews then any advantage? And remember that Romans 1, Paul says, you Gentiles were really, really, really in bad shape. You were pagan, you were misinformed, you were, you were fearfully worshiping a cruel god, cruel gods, plural. And then in chapter 2, he turns to the, his Jewish fellow citizens, and said, and you Jews were worse. Believe it or not, you were worse. You thought you had, you still think you have all the truth. You think that you have a free ticket to heaven. Well, now he comes to chapter three and he says, now let me draw a conclusion. I've already condemned the, the former pagans. I've already condemned the former Jews. So what about that? Have the Jews then any advantage over the Gentiles or is there any value in being circumcised? Much indeed in every way. In the first place, God trusted his message to the Jews. So who has, who has given us the Bible? Jews. Were there any non-Jews who wrote portions of the Bible? Luke. Careful. Luke. Luke and Acts. Yeah. Luke wrote Luke and Acts. By Dr. Luke, yeah, who was a, who was a Greek. But what if some of them were not faithful? Does this mean that God will not be faithful? Certainly not. That's the strongest way you can say it in Greek. Megenoita. God must be true even though every human being is a liar. As the scripture says, you must be shown. Who, and who's he talking about? God. He's talking about God. God, you must be shown to be right when you speak. You must win your case when you are being tried. Note especially that last passage there in verse 4, God must be true even though every human being is a liar. Remember Satan's accusations against God? Do we want to be repeating those accusations against God? We see that God must be shown to be right in what he speaks. He must win his case when he is being tried. If God doesn't win in the great controversy, we're all doomed. 
And how is God put on trial? Huh? Putting God on trial? Each one of us votes either for or against God by the way we live and the way we respond to the truth. Okay, let's see if we can figure that out. Get some more details. Jim? God offered himself, excuse me, God This is Romans 3, 25 and 26, same chapter. So that by his blood, he should become the means by which people's sins are forgiven through their faith in him. God did this in order to demonstrate that he is righteous. In the past, he was patient in overlooking people's sins, but in the present time, he deals with their sins in order to demonstrate his righteousness. In this way, God shows that he himself is righteous and that he puts right everyone who believes in Jesus. Good News Bible. Okay, notice that this passage says three separate times that the purpose of Christ's death was to demonstrate what? Righteous. The righteousness of God. This could only be understood in the larger context of the Great Controversy. Other people who don't understand the Great Controversy, they struggle with this verse. And you don't, if you don't believe that, take a, a bunch of different Bible translations and see what they've done with this verse. And Jesus, they had commentaries. And Bible commentaries. Even the first part of this one mm -hmm. uh, in Romans 3.25 is not the best. But uh, it, all of them, since about, what, about 1560, the Geneva Bible, mm -hmm. there, uh, you know, they, they, they put a phrase in there, Jesus' death was as, a, as an appeasement, a mm -hmm. propitiation. Mm -hmm. Or uh, the uh, RSV uses expiation. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows what all that means, but it, it implies that God is, what, his death was to appease the wrath of, the, of God. Yeah. A pay, terrible pagan. Yeah. There's a footnote in the Good News Bible that says, instead of by his blood, also, says, also includes the possible translation of by his sacrificial death. Yeah. Well, it just... <laughs> It, even his life, you go back to Romans 5.10, mm -hmm. same author, and his, we're healed by his life. We're going we're gonna to have a look at we're that. Get, get to that so. Okay. Jesus <clears throat> died and took our place as a substitute to demonstrate the truth about God and his character and government. So what do we mean by a substitute? You, this has been dragged out and torn apart and dissected in so many ways, it's amazing. It simply means because Jesus died, answered the questions in Great Controversy, and won the Great Controversy on our behalf, we don't have to die. Just like that. He died, we don't have to die. That's substitution. Yeah, this idea of sacrifice, sacrifice generally means you do something to win or change God's mind. Well, and that is not, that's the wrong God. That, of, course, it's, of course it's the wrong God, but that's unfortunate. You use those words without some explanation. Yeah. The, the preconceived notions yeah. uh, hold sway. So Jesus also demonstrated the truth about sin and its deadly results. This is the only passage in Scripture that specifically tries to explain why Jesus died. Now, there's other passages which we... We, we, that help us to explain that and talk about details and so forth. But this one, Paul just specifically says, bang, why did he die? He gives a reason. Nothing in the Old Testament did that. The law may have been holy and the commandment holy and right and good, Romans 7, 12 to 14, but it could not save anyone. So in the light of what we have said so far, notice these very significant words in Hebrews 8, which are repeated, I might add, from Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. Reading from Hebrews chapter 8, verses 10 through 12. Now this is the covenant that I will make with the people of Israel. In the days to come, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. None of them will have to teach their fellow citizens or to say to their fellow citizens, Know the Lord, for they will all know me from the least to the greatest. I will forgive their sins and will no longer remember their wrongs. That's from the Good News Bible. And what does it say in John 17, 3? For that they will all know me. Yes. And that's eternal life. Yep. How simple. Notice that in this context, the solution to the sin problem is for all of us to know God well. Like 
Tim just pointed out, John 17, 3. That's life eternal. If that occurs, there is no problem with God forgiving our sins and he will no longer pay any attention to the record of our wrongs. Hebrews 1, 1 tells us that there are many different ways in which God sought to communicate with the people in the Old Testament. Passages like Hebrews 8, 8 and 9, Psalms 37, 30 through 31, 48, verse 8, 119, verse 11, and Isaiah 51, 7 suggest that there were some who seemed to understand the issues and sought to follow God in the right way, even in the times of the Old Testament. So what is happening in heaven right now? Now, one of the challenges we're going to have for the rest of our study of the book of, uh, of Hebrews is this one. The author of our lessons and Paul, to a certain extent, says, okay, we know what happened in the ancient sanctuary system. We know what those Old Testament people were trying to do. Let us see if we can use that to try to understand what's happening up in heaven now. There's a different approach to that problem, which I like, I much prefer. Let's look at verses in the Bible that tell us exactly what is happening in heaven right now and see how that fits with what was happening in the old system. So let's talk about what the Bible says is actually going on in heaven right now. Zechariah 3, verses 1 through 5. In another vision, the Lord showed me the high priest Joshua standing before the angel of the Lord. And there beside Joshua stood Satan, ready to bring an accusation against him. Okay, who's doing the accusing? Satan. Satan. Who is he accusing? He's accusing Joshua or us. And he's also he's, accusing God. Yeah. Let's be clear about that. Satan is the one who accuses everyone. Okay? Verse 2, the angel of the Lord said to Satan, May the Lord condemn you, Satan, May the Lord who loves Jerusalem condemn you. This man is like a stick snatched from the fire. Joshua was standing there wearing filthy clothes. The angel said to his heavenly attendants, Take away the filthy clothes this man is wearing. Then he said to Joshua, I have taken away your sin and will give you new clothes to wear. He commanded the attendants to put a clean turban on Joshua's head. They did so, and they put the new clothes on him while the angel of the Lord stood there. Okay, the angel of the Lord and Lord, there's in small caps, which means what? Yahweh. Okay, let us understand clearly that the accuser of all human beings and God himself is Satan himself. Okay, this has been true from the very beginning and you remember the passage in Revelation 7, 12, verses 7 to 12. These verses make it very clear who is accusing us? It is the devil or Satan, that ancient serpent who was there in the Garden of Eden and deceived Eve. He now stands symbolically in the presence of God accusing us day and night. And I'm going to just go back and read those verses. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon who fought back with his angels. But the dragon was defeated and he and his angels were not allowed to stay in heaven any longer. The huge dragon was thrown out, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan. So how many names does he have? Serpent, devil, Satan, that deceived the whole world. He was thrown down to earth and all his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now God's salvation has come. Now God has shown his power as king. Now this Messiah has shown his authority. For the one who stood before our God and accused our brothers and sisters, who's the one standing before God and accusing the brothers and sisters? Satan. And uh, day and night has been thrown out of heaven. Our brothers and sisters won the victory over him by the blood of the Lamb, by the death of Jesus, and by all that means, and by the truth, truth which they proclaimed, and they were willing to give up their lives and die. And so be glad, you heavens, and all you that live there. But how terrible for the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, and he's filled with rage, because he knows that he has only a little time left. Imagine the devil filled with rage. Mm. In contrast to Satan, we have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all on our side. Romans 8, 26 through 31. 
no descendant of Levi in the Levitical priesthood could ever stand in heaven and refute Satan's arguments against us. Thus, the ministry of Jesus Christ in the heavenly sanctuary is absolutely essential if we're going to be saved. If no one responded to Satan's accusations, if Satan was just allowed to stand up there and making his, all his accusations against us before the hundreds of millions of angels that are going to be our future neighbors and friends, what chance would we have? But Jesus is the one who's spoken of as doing that since stand up. That's not true. He's, he, he turns, he said, the Lord, he doesn't turn to us and say, rebuke us or something. He turns to Satan and he says, what? The Lord rebuke you, Satan. In other words, you have misrepresented God and you have misrepresented my people. So what does Jesus do as our mediator? From the Bible study guide for Tuesday, the English term mediator is too narrow a translation for mesites, mesites. mesites. Mm -hmm in Hebrews because it forces, it focuses, focuses only on the first two or three uses of the Greek term. Hebrews, however, emphasizes the fourth function. Instead, as Hebrews explains, Jesus is the guarantor or surety of the new covenant, Hebrews 7.22. In Hebrews, the term mediator is equivalent to guarantor. He guarantees that the covenant promises will be fulfilled. Okay, now remember we've talked in the past about this oath-taking. When you take an oath to, to say, say something, then you're guaranteeing that will happen. And if you, if you fail to follow through, you have to die. That was, that was what the old rule said. Following the advice given to Moses by God in the Old Testament system, we have Hebrews 9.22. And we're going go to gonna go into this in a lot more depth. According to the law, this would be, the law refers to what? The Old Testament system. Almost everything is purified by blood and sins are forgiven only if blood is poured out. Okay, forgiven, remitted. Does this mean that Jesus is constantly sprinkling blood here and there and everywhere in the heavenly sanctuary? Of course not. The ministry of Jesus Christ is far superior to that of Moses to that offered to Moses and to the children of Israel. Okay, now we're going to get some details. And this is, I want you to listen to this very carefully because there are different ways of looking at these things. Myra? Okay. Jesus is the greater mediator than Moses because his ministers in the heavenly sanctuary, he ministers in the heavenly sanctuary and has offered himself as the perfect sacrifice for us. Hebrews uh, 8, 1 to 5, and Hebrews 10, 5 to 10. Moses' face reflected the glory of God, Exodus 34, 29 to 35. But Jesus is the glory of God. He is the glory of God. He is okay. the glory of God. Hebrews 1, 3, John 1, 14. Moses spoke with, God's, with God face to face. That still amazes me. Yes. <laughs> Exodus thirty three eleven, But Jesus is God's Word personified. Is God's Word. Jesus is God's Word personified. Yeah. Hebrews 4, 12, and 13. John 1, 1 to 3, and 14. Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Moses Tuesday. spoke with God. Jesus is God. Just like that. Romans 8, 26 to 31 tells us that all three members of the Godhead are on our side. So now that we have a trio of advocates on our side and have been refuting Satan's charges, we recognize that this new covenant has better promises. We may be tempted to think that the new covenant, reading from our Bible study guide, we may be tempted to think that the new covenant has better promises in the sense that it has greater rewards than the old covenant had, a heavenly home, homeland, eternal life, etc. The truth is that God offered the same rewards to the Old Testament believers as he had offered us, read Hebrews 11, 10, and 13 through 16. In Hebrews 8, 6, the better promises refer to different kinds of promises. And it's, it goes even beyond just more of the same. 
In the first coven covenant giving to Moses, given to Moses at Sinai, the people promised three times that they would do all that the Lord had God asked them to do. Exodus 19, 8. And that promise was made even before God had said what he wanted them to do. It's amazing. And then in Exodus 24, 3 and 7, it's repeated twice after they had heard the Ten Commandments. Oh yeah, no problem, God. Whatever you say, we'll just do it. Israel failed to keep their side of the agreement every time. So can we be saved by this contract between us and Jesus Christ? The condition of eternal now reading, I'm reading from, uh, this is from Steps to Christ. The condition of eternal life is now just what it always has been, just what it was in the paradise before the fall of our first parents, perfect obedience to the law of God, perfect righteousness. If eternal life were granted on any condition short of this, then the happiness of the whole universe would be imperiled. The way would be open for sin with all its train of woe and misery to be immortalized. In other words, God cannot admit to heaven anyone who basically would start the great controversy all over again, to put it in other words, right? So how does God actually accomplish this in our lives? Well, look at these two passages, one we've already looked at from a different in a different setting, Jeremiah 31, 33, and Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27. Je uh, um, Jim, I think that's yours. Lord said, the new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel will be like this. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Good news Bible. Ezekiel 36, verses 26 and 27, the Lord said, I will give you a new heart and a new mind. I will take away your stubborn heart of stone and give you an obedient heart. I will put my spirit in you and I will see, excuse me, and I will see to it that you follow my laws and keep all my commands I have given you. Good News Bible. So, when we realize the truth about God's statement to Adam and Eve, and the falsehood of Satan's accusations, it frees us from the fear of God and helps us to fear the right thing, sin. So when you get to heaven, you think you'll feel comfortable going up and giving God a hug? Why don't you out there to think about that? Okay, Carrie? The first covenant document was written by God on tablets of stone and was deposited in the Ark of the Covenant as an important witness of God's covenant with his people. As from Exodus 31, 18 and Deuteronomy 10, 1 through 4. Documents written in stone, however, could be broken and scrolls as Jeremiah had experienced could be cut up and burned. And Jeremiah 36, 23. You remember that story, I hope. It's one that not many people are aware, but the probably, it was probably a scroll of the book of Deuteronomy. They found it had been abandoned in the temple, and when they went to finally get things cleaned up in the temple, they brought that uh, that scroll and they read it to the king. And as he he's reading it, you know, he's, he's unrolling it like this, and he says, "Ah!" And he would cut off a, the pages and a page and throw it in the fire. And he'd read some more, "Ah!" He'd cut off the page and throw it in the fire. Anyway, go ahead. But in the new covenant, God now will write his law in the hearts of the people. The heart refers to the mind, the organ of memory and understanding. As for Jeremiah 3.15, Deuteronomy 29.4, and especially to the place where conscious decisions are made. Again, Jeremiah 3.10, Jeremiah 29.13, from the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Thursday. When Jesus speaks, now from Ellen White, Youth Instructor, September 26, 1901, and some other places, when Jesus speaks of the new heart, this is Ellen White, of course, he means the mind, the life, the whole being. To have a change of heart is to withdraw the affections from the world and fasten them upon Christ. To have a new heart is to have a new mind, new purpose, and new motives. What is the sign of a new heart? A changed life. There is a daily, hourly dying to selfishness and pride. So notice the conclusions of what we have studied so far. 
The problem was never with God's law. The problem was with us not following God's advice, not living it out in our own lives, in our day. In the Pardon? Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Thursday, a paragraph. True obedience comes from the heart as an expression of love. That This love is a distinguishing mark of the presence of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. God pours his love on us through, the, through his Spirit, the reception of whom is expressed by God, Galatians 5.22. Expressed by love. Expressed by love. If our, and here's another passage, this is from uh, Ellen White. Ellen White, you want to go ahead? If our hearts are renewed in the likeness of God, if the divine love is implanted in the soul, will not the law of God be carried out in the life? When the principle of love is implanted in the heart, when, men, when man is renewed after the image of him that created him, the new covenant promise is fulfilled. I will put my law in their hearts and in their minds will I write them, Hebrews 10, 16. Okay, I'm gonna interrupt, interrupt there for a second. So we've read several passages now from the Bible study guide and also from the Bible saying that the per permanent solution to the problem of sin is for us to know God and God will write his rules and everything in our hearts and minds, meaning that we will, what will happen? We will do right because it is right. We will do right because it is right. That's Christ's Opie Lessons, page 97 and 98. And then we used to say, follow that up with, not because of a promise of a reward or, or a threat of punishment. No. Okay. Continuing with, uh, from Steps to Christ. And if the law is written in the heart, will it not shape the life? Obedience, the service and allegiance of love, is the true sign of discipleship. Thus the scripture says, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. First John 5, 3 and, uh, and chapter two, verse four. Instead of releasing man from obedience, it is faith and faith only that makes us partakers of the grace of God which enables us to render obedience. The closer you come to Jesus, the more faulty you will appear in your own eyes, for your vision will be clearer and your imperfections will be seen in broad and distinct uh, contrast to his perfect nature. Wow. This is evidence that Satan's delusions have lost their power, that the vivifying influence of the Spirit of God is arousing you. That's, um Pretty strong, pretty, pretty blunt language there. Continuing with Ellen White's words, no deep-seated love for Jesus can dwell in the heart that does not realize its own sinfulness. The soul that is transformed by the grace of Christ will admire his divine character. But if we do not see our own moral deformity, it is unmistakable evidence that we have not had a view of the beauty and excellence of Christ. Ellen White, Steps to Christ, page 60 through 20, 65, with wow. selected pages. Think about these statements. What do they mean to you? Can we trust God for his salvation and not look to our own failures? The law will point out our sins, but with the help of the Holy Spirit, those sins can be overcome. Now, how does that happen? We can't change ourselves. All we can do is allow God the opportunity to work in our hearts and in our minds. And God can change things, make things new. In previous lessons, we have discussed the case of Melchizedek. Without re redoing all those details, we notice that Jesus Christ is a priest in the order of Melchizedek. And the order of Melchizedek is superior to the Leviticus priesthood. Now, what ways is it superior? Think you could name all those ways? The first, Melchizedek, is without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, Hebrews 7, 3. Does that mean that Melchizedek is still alive? No. No. It just means that we have no record of his death. We okay? Have no record of his birth. Yeah, no record of his birth, no record of his death, no record of his parents or of his descendants. 
in the Greco-Roman world, to be without father meant to be an illegitimate child. To be without mother meant that the child was born from a woman of low social status. In the Jewish world, however, to be without genealogy meant that the person could not qualify for the Levitical priesthood. Was so now Mel Melchizedek is in trouble, right? Yeah. He, he has no proof of anything here. Was Melchizedek a divine figure, as some people have concluded? No, he appears suddenly on the scene in Genesis 14 and disappears just as quickly again, but without any mention of his family uh, background. Because of the Genesis record, does, because the Genesis record does not tell of his father, mother, or genealogy, Paul employs Melchizedek as a perfect example of the eternal nature of Christ. This is supported by the statement, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever, Hebrews 7, 3. Okay. Second, Melchizedek is superior to the Levites because he, is blessed, he blessed Abraham, the patriarch, who is described as one who received the promise, Hebrews 6, 13, and Hebrews 7, 6. Thus, it is beyond dispute that the inferior Abraham is blessed by the superior Melchizedek, Hebrews they 7, don't, 7. Okay, so obviously you don't expect someone in a lower status or with less authority to be blessing someone with a higher status or higher authority. It's the person who has a higher authority blesses the person at lower authority. Yes. Okay. Not only is Melchizedek superior to the Levites because of his continuous priesthood, but he is also superior because he blessed Abraham. Third, Melchizedek is superior to the Levites because even Abraham, the patriarch, gave him one, a tenth of his spoils, Hebrews 7, 4. The great-grandson, Levi, and his descendants basically returned ties through Abraham to this non-Levitical priest of God, Melchizedek, Hebrews 7, 9, and 10. The lack of Levitical genealogy does not prevent Melchizedek from receiving tithes <laughs> from Abraham. Okay. Yeah. In the same way, a lack of Levitical genealogy cannot prevent Christ, or Jesus, from serving as priest. The logic of his, of his argument is obvious. Melchizedek is greater than Abraham. Consequently, he must be greater than Levi. By extension, the priesthood of Melchizedek is greater than that of the Levitical priesthood. If that is true, Christ's priesthood is superior to that of any human priest in the earthly tabernacle or temple. Hence, he is called priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Okay. Now, just to review real quickly, what are the re what are the basis on which Melchizedek is better? Well, he's not dependent on gene genealogy. He blessed Abraham, proving that he is superior. And Abraham was obviously the great grandfather of Levi, so he's clearly superior to Levi. And superior to the Levites. He's superior to all the Levites. Yeah. And so he doesn't, he doesn't depend on any of those things that the Levitical priesthood depends upon. So we can conclude that Melchizedek was superior to the Levites because of his continuous priesthood. It doesn't mean he's really a continuous priest. It means that we have no record of his beginning or his ending. He blessed Abraham, the ancestor of the Levites, and the Levites returned tithes to Melchizedek through Abraham. So how is Christ's pre priesthood superior to Melchizedek's and the Levitical priesthood? Now we're going to talk about Jesus. First, Christ became a priest by the power of an indestructible life. And by God's appointment, as witnessed to by Psalm 110.4, it was not through physical descent based on Aaronic legal requirements, Hebrews 7, 16, and 17, and in Exodus 29, Christ's priesthood is intimately connected to who he is. Yes, Christ died, but he was resurrected, Hebrews 13, 20. He was exalted above the heavens, and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, Hebrews 8, 1, where he is able 
for all time to save those who approach God through him. Now, if you believe that the purpose of the uh, priest uh, is, is to teach you about God, who could do that better than Jesus? And if you want to know whether he has access to God, he's sitting <laughs> next to God on the throne of heaven. How could you have better access than that? Okay, second, Christ was confirmed as a priest by God through an oath. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. So remember, we, we've, we've learned that those oaths, if you fail with your half of the oath, then you're supposed to die because you didn't uphold your half of the bargain. So this is serious stuff. Oaths are solemn promises after often evoking a divine witness. Because God could not swear by a greater divine power when he promised Abraham descendants, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and multiply you. To the Exodus generation, God swore, they will not enter my rest. When God swears an oath, he will faithfully execute it. That is why Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. The Levites, on the other hand, were inaugurated into the priesthood by divine command. So God didn't swear an oath, guaranteeing it on his side. He says, you just do it not by an oath, thus Christ is superior to them. Finally, Christ is superior to the Levitical priesthood because he is morally perfect. The priests of Aaron's line sacrificed daily, although ultimately ineffectively. They offered sacrifice first for their own sins before they offered sacrifice for others. By contrast, Christ offered himself as a sinless sacrifice once for all. Such a priest is appropriate for us, for he is holy, blameless, undefiled, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens. Well, he's up there in, next to God's throne, in, next to God's throne, isn't he? While these terms are virtually synonymous, they nonetheless have slightly different nuances. Christ is morally separated, innocent, and unstained by sin. Such attributes make Christ superior to the Aaronic line of priests. In summary, Christ is better than the Levites because he is immortal, was confirmed by divine oath. We don't have to worry about Christ dying and, oh, sorry, our high priest is gone. Uh, we had to do some business with an international an initial agency today. And we called up to get it done. Said, oh, sorry, that lady retired. Boom, what do you do now? So he was confirmed by a divine oath and is morally perfect. How would you like to have to offer a lamb or a bull as an offering every time you committed a sin? Maybe in our day it would be like an offering expensive bike or a car. In this lesson, we've seen that the ministry of Christ following the example of Melchizedek is far superior to the Levitical priesthood because Christ is in heaven, sitting next to the throne of God and can plead for us if necessary right there. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for these blessed promises which we've been able to study here. We thank for we're thankful for Paul and Luke that probably helped him in writing this particular book. We thank you for the assurances we have even in our day through these times 2,000 years after that all happened that we can still claim these promises. May they be true for us today and through these coming weeks. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.